Um, next one up, we have Rowan, if you want to come up on stage. And you'll be really kind of like already connecting the dots a little bit between at least LLMs and climate change. So we'll try to. <clears throat> yeah, thank you. And thanks so much for uh, the Bezos for Fund and Foresight for, for organizing and inviting me. Uh, it's definitely a privilege to be, to be here. Um, surprisingly, I'm going to talk about language models. Um, hopefully, this will be interesting. I'm by no means a climate expert, uh, but have spent a lot of time over the last year thinking about the opportunities for language models to be helpful, uh, helpful in climate. Before we get started, how many people here have already sort of built or thought about building or deploying an application using language models? Raise a hand. So quite a, quite a few. And how, how, many, so how many have shipped something to production and it's in use? OK, slightly fewer. Awesome. Well, that's still it's super exciting to see. We're already, uh, there's already a ton that needs to be built. OK, so before I dive too deep into it, I just want to uh, quickly address sort of what we might call traditional ML applications, of which there are many. And a lot of the talks today have touched upon them. And wh whether it be, you know, computer vision for uh, you know, monitoring forests or RL for process control. Um, what I mean by traditional ML applications are techniques that take some sort of domain-specific data, often numerical in nature, and then produce a bespoke model uh, to enable impact in, in one of these areas. And of course, there are far more, and we're nowhere close to reaching the ceiling of what's possible with these tools. But I want to spend this time talking about language models and the opportunities here. And I think there's been a pretty big open question about what's even possible. Um, and language models, by contrast, are general purpose in, in nature. They're trained on text, maybe image to text uh, or speech to text. Uh, but fundamentally, they reason over text and they form uh, sophisticated representations of text. And that's what enables things like ChatGPT uh, and other tools. So, when we think about how they can be useful in climate, uh, it can be less obvious what the opportunities are. So I'll start by talking about two examples where they have had impact in slightly different domains, and then try to present a perspective uh, on the climate problem and see if there are some interesting use cases uh, that, that, that we can chat about. And I'll talk about also some startups that have been really building some really compelling stuff. So 55%. Some of you might be familiar with this number. It's how much faster software engineers were able to complete a task when given access to a coding assistance called GitHub Copilot. So they were able to finish this task almost twice as fast and also to higher quality. This is significant. And we're also seeing a similar pattern in other industries, like operations. Here's an example of Ryan Pearson, CEO of, of, of Flexport, which is a freight logistics company. Uh, they built a tool to help their operational teams compress the time it takes to complete a task from 30 minutes down to 20 seconds. That's a 90x speed up, which is, which is again, su substantial. We call this sort of the co-pilot effect. That's how it's starting to get popularized and, and understood. And what it really means is that it turns out when you take a language model that has access to some context about a domain, and you give this tool to the experts who are responsible for doing different kinds of knowledge work or operational work, it turns out you can do work faster and at higher quality. So this is, this is kind of interesting. But there's still this open question about how do we apply this to climate. So maybe we can start by thinking about the life cycle of a climate solution. I think we all know, and all of you are bigger experts on, on me uh, with this, but the thing that I do understand about this is we have to build a lot of stuff quickly. Uh, and so construction, bricks and mortar, moving atoms, that's really the name of the game. But if we look at what it takes to build something, there's a lot of processes in between. There's assessment, siting, financing, permitting and regulation, procurement processes. Then you get the construction, and then the operations and maintenance. And of course, this is an approximation. I'm not an expert here. And I'm probably leaving a ton out, and this is an oversimplification. But the question we can ask is perhaps how do we get to here faster? And I'll talk about some of the use cases uh, that, of, of startups that are doing really amazing, amazing things uh, tackling this problem. So Paces is, is a company. It's a startup company that is 
focused on building for the renewable project developer, giving them tools to do site selection faster. Spark is a company in a similar space, thinking about site selection, project developers, but also a little bit about the financing piece. Streamline is a company that is building a co-pilot for grant writers. So if you're a hard tech company, how do you find which grants are most likely to be successful uh, when you're applying? And how can you speed up the cycle time for applying to those grants and, and, and winning them? So they're building tools to make that a lot faster. Bloomin Systems is a company that is doing the same thing, but they're designing for the geospatial uh, analyst, and they're designing for the land use planner uh, and helping accelerate the permitting uh, cycles. Proxy is a really interesting company. They're thinking about how to build tools to let homeowners find the most relevant retrofits so that they can install them faster and make use of federal tax rebates and municipal policies. And then the last company I'll just highlight, and I think there's so much more room for opportunity here, is Climate Base. So Climate Base, of course, across all of this entire life cycle, we need people, and we need them to be trained, and we need them to do the work as fast as they can, as, as fast as we can enable them to. And so Climate Base is building tools to help these people find access to training, uh, you know, uh, and, and discover which, which companies are, are, are hiring, and, and they're building assistive tools to, to help every person do that. So it's really exciting times. Quickly on what enables this. I won't go too in depth, but these are some of the capabilities that language models, sort of the underlying, and I know we were told not to talk about jargon, but things like in-context in reasoning, retrieval, vector databases, fine-tuning, prompt chaining, these are some of the concepts that you'll start to hear. And what these startup companies are doing is they're looking at these components and building products and services that are value added and they're designing for people throughout the climate cycle or the life cycle of a climate solution that are historically under designed for. And so I think there's an interesting question about the future when, you know, this is the decisive decade as we know, speed and scale matters. We know that LLMs have shown promise in reducing operational bottlenecks. And it turns out that there could be a lot of operational bottlenecks on scaling human coordination, reducing information asymmetries, um, and uh, building products and services to make every single person more productive. And so the question that I have is, what happens when we build all of those startups? Because I think there are many waiting to be built. What happens when we build all of them? Can we reach net zero a year faster, two years faster? And I think that's a worthwhile investment. They'll finish on this Dolly 3 generated uh, picture of the earth that we're all working hard to protect. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you very much. Uh, I want to know your view on the fact that uh, large language models hallucinate. I use chat GPT all the time to write beautiful text and I stopped asking factual questions to chat GPT weeks ago. Can I ask if you're using GPT-4? <laughs> Can I ask if you're using GPT-4? Because uh, so it's a, it, to answer your question, it's still an open research problem. Uh, GPT-4 is much better at avoiding hallucinations than 3.5. Um, there's on, on the previous slide, I talked about function calling. So these models are now capable of writing, of making API calls to things like web browsers and getting more up-to-date information that they can pull into their context and then faithfully reason around and then present you with a more accurate information. Um, so I, th I would think about the base model as a text reasoning engine and something that's also capable of interfacing with tools. Uh, when you're thinking about you know, what the latest news is, you're probably going to use a news service to do that instead of just trying to think about it off the top of your head. Um, and so the more we give language models these capabilities, the more faithful they'll become. Awesome. Thank you so much, Mo. Thanks. Can we take one more? OK, one more. All right. Thank you so much. Um, thank you, Noel. Just to uh, um, see we work so well together. Um, <clears throat> just a quick question. So you showed us exactly what many of us in this room know is true, know to be true. And maybe this is a question for you, but even for the larger audience for these next couple of days, which is it is not over time. It has not been difficult for private sector companies, startups to adopt innovative technology and apply them, especially when you're looking at mostly bottom line, right? You want to you hit a number, you want to make a certain amount. 
when we're talking about uh, on the ground, frontline organizations who are looking to solve these really intractable challenges, what we've seen, and this is the reason why we're having this workshop, is that it has not been as straightforward a capability to adopt certain technologies, certain innovative technologies for a number of reasons. Can you share some insight as to why that is the case and where you have seen, because you outlined some startups and tech companies, where you have seen nonprofits and frontline organizations adopting uh, innovative technology for impact? Yeah, so just so I understand the question, how do we accelerate the adoption of these kinds of technologies and making, make sure, how do we know that they're being applied to the right problems, is that roughly? How do we ensure that the, uh, all organizations have access to this and can Get use it for it. impact, not just yeah. bottom line? Yeah. Cool. Yeah, so I, I think I think there's uh, a few pieces here. I mean, ChatGPT is obviously an example of a, a tool that anyone can sort of pick up and get value out of immediately. Um, but it, it has limitations in the sense that all of those capabilities I talked about requires engineering effort and the ingenuity of startup teams to figure out how to stitch them together to build a bespoke solution for solving a specific problem. So there is, right now, to, to, to make the most of these language models, you have to have some technical fluency to know how to, you have to have two things. You have to have, one, enough domain expertise to understand what the problems are. Then you have to have an intuition of the sort of capability frontier to know, okay, is this, if I invest time in this, is this actually going to be tractable? Uh, and then you have to have the engineering skills to actually put it all together. I think over time, this will get a lot easier. I mean, you know, a lot of those, again, capabilities, people are building companies and there's a whole ecosystem evolving around LLM, ops, and so forth. So I think it'll get easier over time. Um, GPT-4 was released <coughs> seven months ago and a lot of innovation is just waiting to happen. So I think we should do it a lot faster um, and there's a long way to go, but. I have to, I you to close it out. There, there'll be a lot of uh, discussion afterwards. It's a very much a yes and question. Okay, then just do it. Yeah, go for it. So, you know, training GPT-3 was a massive carbon footprint, right? And GPT-4 even more so. Training GPT-4 took more water from the state of Iowa. Uh, Microsoft used uh, an order of magnitude more water to cool the computers for training GPT-4. To, and Iowa is not a water constrained state, state, right? So, so to the point where the drinking water supply was endangered, just to train GPT-4. So, how do we balance the use of foundation models more broadly than LLMs in a space like climate with the massive, irresponsible use of resources that it takes to to train and deploy those models? Yeah, it's a, it's a really good question. Um, the AI efficiency compute problem is something that we're obviously looking very closely at, and we're lucky to be able to work with Microsoft on how we solve that problem. Um, I think the other, so there's there's the first problem of, um, you know, how do you how do you make, you know, efficiency improvements and make sure that you can s s run these systems at scale uh, in an environmentally responsible way, and we're obviously looking really closely at that. Um, and then the second, but the second piece is, given the existence of one of those systems, what sort of applications, climate positive applications, can you build? And I think there's a huge room. Uh, there's there's so much room for things to be built in that space. Uh, and actually, like inference costs versus training costs are a bit different different as well. Um, so, for example, when you're running these applications, it's not quite the same compute equation, but it's a really important thing to call out and to continue to have discussions on. Okay, now, cool. thank you. Thanks.